So welcome, this is the RE Implementation Lab for the theme of trust, which is coming up in February. And I wanna say hi to everyone who uh, missed the recording yesterday. Zoom platform had a little trouble for the first time we've ever used them. So here we are on a Thursday doing this and uh, I think we're good. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about I'll call it my top 10 points about the packet so you can get an overview and then we'll go into some challenges, opportunities and solutions for each other. So um, just like in a regular service, I always do announcements. Just so you know, the next two labs are in February. First Wednesday, February 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern time will be May's theme of curiosity. And since we're all Westerners here, California and Colorado, I'll say it's also uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time and 11 a.m. Mountain time. And then the second Wednesday will be our recorded implementation lab for the next month's theme, and that will be the theme of journey for the month of March. Um, okay, what does it mean to be a people of trust? So when you look at your packet, the cover that's on there is of a person paragliding. That's with a parachute and a little person underneath. And I usually don't um, participate in the choosing of the covers. And that one just was awesome for me. I have to mention it because my husband was a paraglider up until about 10 years ago. And he, that's a, it's an incredible sport. He loved flying and this flight across um, Golden, Colorado off of Lookout Mountain, 4,000 feet in the air is what he liked to do. And so there was the cover for the theme of trust. It was close to my heart. So I saw four buckets. It, for the theme of trust. The first was trusting life. And I started thinking about that by thinking about Groundhog Day. The little groundhog has to have the courage to come out of his hole and check out what life is going on around him. The next is love and trust for Valentine's Day. Then there's trusting each other. And I saw that as an opportunity to revisit covenants. We often do those in September. And then there's a whole bunch of families that join or, you know, people forgotten the covenant. And I thought this would be a nice time to revisit covenants and their meaning and what it means for us to be a people of trust. And the last session of the four uh, buckets is called trusting yourself. And for me, that was having a sense of in, um, intuition, trusting your intuition, and trusting your abilities. So for the littlest ones, the message is, hey, you're growing up, and now you can skip and jump really high. Can you trust yourself to do that? So those were my four buckets. And now I want to do the top 10 favorite parts of the trust packet that I liked so much. Um, researching and finding out. So I've been a DRE for over 30 years. I retired two years ago from the trenches. And I still learn things about this amazing faith of ours. So the first thing I'll mention is learning about a woman named Fanny Barrier Williams. She was an African-American Unitarian in the Chicago area who worked just as hard on women's suffrage and black suffrage and black equality in the 1800s as Susan B. Anthony did. And yet I had never heard of her. She started a hospital. She started an um, organization, a settlement house. She started the NAACP and I'd never heard of her. And yet she's a African-American UU. So I put her in that UU history section as a way of emphasizing 
that, well, we always did Susan B. Anthony in Valentine's Day because her birthday is Valentine's Day or right next to it. And yet when we understand how much we've missed the stories of people of color, we find out Fannie Barrier, Fannie Barrier Williams was born February 15th. So she should be right there for us for Valentine's Day. And we're lucky because Tapestry of Faith has a beautiful story about her, which is accessible online. And I have the link in the packet. So that was one of my top tens. The next top 10 is the fact that it is Black History Month. And if we are a people of trust, the theme gives us this wonderful angle that we trust that change is possible. And that has to do with our idealism as a group of people. We're always idealistic. We always are hoping for the best and we trust that change is possible. Last weekend, I visited Washington DC with my family and we, it was mostly shut down, but the US Congress building was still there and there were some very moving movies and things. And one of my nephews said, he thinks the senators and Congress people should view these very moving movies about the, the founding of our country and the meaning of being uh, in service every morning before they walk into chambers. I really like that. So for me, understanding Black History Month also meant walking by the statue that they put up of uh, Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and Sojourner Truth. They are among the um, you know, founding fathers of our country. Uh, so Black History Month is number two. Number three is the song, I Will Be Your Standing Stone. So with us is Allison, who was in the Renaissance module, where they came up for their curriculum project, A Song for All Ages. And that moment back at the Benneville Pines in California, what maybe a year ago, is what started me saying, when I write these packets, I always wanted to include a song for all ages because it can start, yeah, <laughs> it can start breaking down the silos of music and RE and social justice and worship. And we can have the music people doing for all ages. Anyway, you guys did uh, This Little Light of Mine, which was something else I had never heard of, um, that it was written by an African-American woman. I forget her name even. Uh, when you said Fannie Williams, I kind of thought maybe it was Fannie Williams, but I don't think it was. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a wonderful moment, a real teaching moment for me. And this new song called I Will Be Your Standing Stone, Liza Earl Centers gave it to me as an idea. Um, she's in a Vermont congregation. And this woman is, is teaching her choral group on the YouTube video. And she says, this was written by her for a friend who had cancer. And she says, I will be your standing stone. And it gives me chills and I really hope everyone makes some connection with our children and families with that song because it's so, so powerful. Then the fourth thing is, Again, going into the whole UU Black history, J. Lynn Scott, Reverend J. Lynn Scott, became my thought partner for the first time for this packet. He's been hired by, by Soul Matters to give me yet one more person to help develop these ideas. And she and I came up with wording that we hope will be helpful to our congregations that when trust is broken, we are wounded, and wounded, wounds leave scars. There are many scars and wounds caused by racism. People of color can't always trust our institutions, like police and banks. 
Sometimes our own UU denomination has betrayed the trust of people of color. Right now, by telling the stories and understanding racism, we are trying to tr take steps to be a people of trust. So those are words that I would say in my own chapel or with a family that comes to me that says, what are we supposed to do with Black History Month? When trust is broken, we are wounded and wounds create scars. And racism has done this. So I hope it's helpful for multi-gen services or for children's chapel, but it's listed in several places there, those actual, um, that wording. The idea of using a video as story, Jay Lynn found this beautiful PBS uh, story about the Children's March. And the, it's much better than anything I had found. And this is why I am so happy to have a thought partner because sometimes I'll be going down my little wormhole and she can find something that's <laughs> even better. So I wanted to lift up that video could be it's as engaging as reading a book if, if you um, want to do that kind of thing. Uh, right, that's six. So, oh no, that was five. So number six of my top 10 is the heaven and hell story. And I've actually done this with youth. And this is the story of a person who goes asked to see heaven and hell. What's the difference? And they go in and people are trying to reach with these large spoons and they can't and then that's hell. And they go in to the next room and it's the exact same situation. They have these long spoons, but the reason it's heaven is that they are trusting each other to feed each other. And it's one of the core stories that I use in my career because it's so illustrative of trust and of community. And I'm always, as a religious educator, I'm always like, so senses, we're gonna actually feed each other. You can tape dowels onto spoons, yes, and actually have them try and feed each other. It's, it's like a memory, it's a memory moment right then. That's my favorite. And welcome to someone who just joined us. Yes, hi, it's Irene Prager. Hi, Irene, good to have you with us. I was at staff meeting, so I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no problem. Well, we're all, you know, we're in a new place in new time, and this is being recorded, so I just wanted to highlight that. So we have okay. a listening audience who's going to join us whenever is convenient for them. Hopefully, they'll be okay. in the Grammys or something. So that was number six of my top 10. Then number seven is the whole idea that comes around in February for many of our congregations, and that's called Surprise Pals. And that's the idea of having, oh my gosh, we used to, like in the 80s, we'd call it secret friends. <laughs> and of course, that language is exactly what pedophiles use to groom their victims. And as soon as we realized that, we're like, yeah, we got it something else. So I'm very happy that it's called Mystery Pals or Surprise Pals. Surprise Pals is my favorite. And the connection for those, that little ritual which I put in the packet, is that we share that which is precious to us. Our stories and our hopes and our vulnerabilities. So trust is at the core of Surprise Pals. And when you look at it through thematic ministry lenses, you realize how powerful it is. It's not just this sweet little Valentine's thing. It's sharing us as a people of trust. So number eight, I'm gonna do one of my little show and tells as a religious educator, I always do this. So I like to use puppets because they can be foils. And this little puppet is named Shy Rabbit. And Shy Rabbit can join you to be a person, people of trust in chapel. 
and I've put a little dialogue that I think teachers can do about Shy Rabbit and the Wonder Box or the reflection time with um, preschool and elementary schools, uh, school children. The reason that you can be a person of trust is we have to be very quiet and Shy Rabbit is very scared of us. And, and it might come out if, if, if she can trust us. Isn't that right? Yes, oh look, she's thinking about it. Can we be really quiet and ask Shy Rabbit if she would come and meet us? Can you do that with me? Please come out and meet us. We will be very quiet and we will be very loving. Yeah, we promise. And when you have a puppet in your hand, if you can turn the puppet and not look at it so that the puppet becomes an independent force and a little thing, isn't that right? Yeah, see, she's saying, yeah, you're doing okay. It's a little tricky to think about the webinar and the puppet at the same time. But when the children can show Shy Rabbit, that she can trust them, she will come and give them a rabbit kiss on the cheek. And that's your wonder box or your reflection time for, for love and trust or trusting life. Shy Rabbit doesn't trust life very often. She's pretty scared. And I use puppets in RE as a foil because who wants to say, oh yes, I'm shy, I am very, trusting of life. That's hard to do, but when you have a puppet, they can be the foil for the one who's shy. I use puppets for death, too. That when somebody, who wants to say in a group of fellow children, oh yeah, I don't understand death, I really hate talking about it. But if you have a little puppet that comes and says, well, what happens after you die? It's something I don't like talking about. Then they can be in conversation. Thank you, Shy Rabbit. Thank you for coming on the webinar. I thought I'd share that with you because it's easier to see it than it is to read about it. And, and so I wrote the little dialogue in there, but I wanted you to see it and see what I was imagining. That's Little Rabbit. And that was number eight. Number nine, comes out of the way that I come up with these ideas. When I have my matrix for brainstorming of 10 things, 10 topics, um, like music that relates to the theme, UU course stories that relate to the theme, um, world religions that might relate to the theme. One of the most important is kid culture. It's what I call kid culture. So what's going on in the kid culture that has to do with the theme. And so for me, for the theme of being a people of trust, it's the pinky swear. This, this is something that kids do for each other. They're like, you have to pinky swear on that. It's almost like double dare and dare you. To do a pinky swear is a way of showing that you can be a person of trust. And so in the packet, there are about eight different types of pinky swears that are with the covenant lesson session from around the world. So in Czechoslovakia, they do some other kind of thing. In Scotland, they have a different thing they say, but I thought it would be fun um, to do the kid culture pinky swear as part of looking at and examining um, covenants. That was number nine. Oh, here's nine and a half, God's promise uh, of the rainbow with the Noah story is another um, angle. If you're doing uh, Judeo-Christian stuff at all in your church, you can do that as an angle for covenant. Um, and I put that in the packet. Okay, number 10 of my top 10 favorite things about this packet on trust is this is a time when you can do, um, there's somebody, hi, Irene. <laughs> <laughs> you can do trust games with the youth. So in my days, way back in the 60s and 70s, these were some of the most favorite youth nights ever. 
was to do those trust falls and trust walks and picking each other up with two fingers. There's a whole bunch of trust things that are in the deep fun um, links at the UUA and I included those. There's a lot of caveats now because you have to have a group that is in the bonding stage. You don't wanna maybe do this when they don't know each other very well. And you also have to be very aware that <laughs> it's not a joke because you don't want someone to drop on the floor. In the family section, I put this as a suggestion for a family to do. And then I put a link to a video called Trust, Fall, Fail. And they have a little girl and it, she might be a neighbor or a cousin. And they're like, oh, it's really cool. All I have to do is fall and I'll catch you. And you close your eyes and you just fall. And the dad says, yeah, just fall. It's okay. We'll catch you. And the little girl, girl goes around behind her and they're all set. And the dad says, one, two, three. And she falls forward. And there's no one there to catch her. Oh. So that's why there's the caveat about doing these in an organized way and make sure the directions are clear because you don't want anybody to be hurt. And, and yet, because it's slightly risky and because it's this body thing, it's very memorable. And I think once a year, every youth group should do these trust games because they are so pivotal to establishing the group as a gestalt. So that's my top 10 for the packet. That's my way of doing an overview. So if you're an auditory learner, you don't have to pour through it all and maybe it'll help you with the ideas. Um, so now I'd love to open it up. You don't have to, but if you have a challenge, We'll do challenges first or opportunity second and solution and takeaway. I'm just gonna write them down so I remember the order. And we can share with each other. So as you're thinking about the month coming up, February, what are your challenges for using the theme and the packet? And I love to go around I'll call you out in the order you appear on my screen, but if you have nothing to say and you just want to alert, just say, I'm fine. So Allison's first on my screen. Um, I have to look at my schedule for um, February. Um, that I bet, you know, depending on what my ministers, um, we're working together with the themes, but sometimes she goes a bit off theme. <laughs> yeah. So my challenge is gonna be, let me see what she's got here. She hasn't really written anything here about what the themes for February are. So, um, but that's, that's really just my challenge is um, just trying to connect with her and make sure that, um, you know, sometimes what we're doing in the RE packets doesn't, um, Totally connect with what she's doing so but that's just something that we have to work out yep awesome great thanks Allison um, next on my screen is Fran oh hi welcome hi. I want to take one moment for a second sure. oh look <laughs> I just moved in a few days ago this is brand new territory to me and I'm just in love with you and this whole group and my background is in theater and in mime and movement I've been an artist in the schools for many years and the big idea to me is always the preset so like that trust fall I've done that in theater and also I've done it in a ropes course a high ropes course where we learn trust 30 feet up in the air Obviously, we're wearing harnesses, and you've got six people holding the belay line, but it's still not easy to trust, because trust is broken every day, and it's built every day. It's a moment-to-moment, -moment. 
my big question is like, how do we as adults, myself and anybody that's in my team that I don't know, you know, how do we visit trust? The other day we had an incident and it made me aware that I was trusting somebody and it probably wasn't a good thing to do, but I'm brand new. So I'm just trying to learn how to use anything, no matter what happens, as a possibility for uh, a learning. And that brings me to a, a song that I know, but I don't know where I know it from. I do a lot of work with uh, Dances of Universal Peace oh. and uh, Peace Choir. Mm -hmm. So my background is uh, kinesthetic because I'm a mime mm -hmm. dancer everything to me has got to be moved because children are always moving. And instead of just saying, let's get the wiggles out, let's do Tai Chi. Let's learn something. Let's understand the subtle body. Let's understand the unspoken. Let's understand that there's six people in the room and nobody's even looked at each other in the eye. You know, um, because I'm new, I've got a lot of ideas and I'm trying to learn how to calm myself down and just observe and not get too, um, caught up with trying to implement everything because the little girl in me is just jumping around with joy because I've had the privilege of, you know, learning some things about um, what I think are really kid friendly. And if you have a population that comes in and you don't know who they are um, in terms of the, that's my big question to you is if you don't know 10 kids come in one uh, Sunday, but 14 kids come in another one or three come in and, and their age is um, three, six, and 10. Uh, and you've got either one or two. Yeah, I don't, I haven't seen and I don't have access to it. I'm hearing some other things going on. Am I talking in the wrong? I'll put it on mute, I'm sorry. There we go. Yeah, it was just a, great. That's the way to do it so we don't hear the other people talking. Thanks. Anyway, my thoughts are, you know, how I'm asking for your prayers to, to keep calm and to recognize the opportunity that is always here. It's in the present moment, not just in my dream world. And I love the fact that you have this curriculum available and that there's this Zoom opportunity. And to do it without, um, I like being live, and this is really exciting to me. So uh, I know that some of the challenges that I have, maybe I would talk to some of you uh, personally, you know, and not on the, the Zoom, but I'd like to just know that I always look for the silver lining, and I'm kind of an optimist, and sort of always have, you know, pink glasses on. So I think that it'll probably serve me well, but uh, I probably need to learn to take the pink off of the glasses sometimes as well, because I think that trust has to do with boundaries. And I just listened to Renee Brown the other day. I think that was a suggestion. And I just thought her, her words were really brilliant. She said, we don't like to talk about boundaries. That sometimes, you know, some parenting styles or teaching styles is everything's very permissive, everything's okay. Other people are teaching and parenting like, they are the authority, but there's not, and then the middle is, I, there's an authoritarian, there's a calm presence, but it's not like you're, you know, squishing and having this control. I'm, it's tricky, it's very tricky. I find that some teachers that make me shudder are, are people that don't have a, a lesson that's actually planned. It feels like it's too loose. Mm -hmm. And I, I have these concerns. Anyway, I'm very, very grateful that uh, <laughs> I can see you on these little cartoon screens. <laughs> and I know, I'm it's cool. thankful. I'm thankful. It's, thank you, Fran. It is wonderful that we can be from Massachusetts to California. It used to be very isolating to be the only DRE in a congregation. And now we have this kind of platform and I love it too. Thanks, Fran. Next is Irene. Oh, um, you're asking for challenges, right? That is correct. I'm not sure I have any challenges for February. I, um, I started a new class, and when I think about the trust, 
I think I very quickly got the trust of these kids because they're, it's a smaller group and um, I listened to what they said. Mm-hmm. And, and for me, Unitarian Universals, the most important thing is choice. So I always try to build choice into my lesson plan. In other words, I'm honoring where they're coming from. And so they give me with their trust. Um, I, that's probably all I have to say on it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Well, yes, so we have challenges of the planning and the connection mm-hmm. to our fellow staff members and to doing thematic ministry. Really, thematic ministry is an evolving way of doing ministry, isn't it? We've only been doing it for maybe three years at the most, maybe five. And so we're all learning how to be a staff together and come up with these things. Other challenges for um, Fran, it's being new, and Irene. I have a, I, I must say I have a young minister. Mm-hmm. And having worked with older ministers, they're pretty set in their ways. Working with a younger minister, they are very open to the sharing, the ideas, and very collaborative. Or at least this minister is very collaborative. And I, I'm just having a hard time working with him. Oh, wonderful. That's so good to hear. All right. So challenges, what Now that we've heard these challenges um, and you've had a little time to reflect, what do you see as possible solutions we can offer each other? Um, Katie, can I bring in one more challenge? Sorry. No. Um, Yeah, there might be noise from the background, but um, so one of the challenges I had is something that Fran touched upon, and that is having the different age groups all together and and you don't know who's going to show up and you don't know if it's going to be young or old. So what I like about your packet is that you have the different age groups. What's challenging for me is having the flexibility. I mean, I can be flexible and go up and down, but helping my um, other teachers to really have that um, open mind frame to say, okay, look, you know, here's a lesson, but we might have to take it down or here's, we're going to go with this and we might have to take it up. Um, So I find that to be, a, a really big challenge um, with with the job, but um, yeah. yeah, it's more it's more so for I think the people that I work with. Like I know that I'm gonna have to be flexible, but having uh, people that really can accept that flexibility. Yeah. I mean, I think also what Fran said is really important: have choices because the kids like to have choices. Sometimes they're not going to be into what you're doing, and they're going to say like no. So it's much better. If you give them, okay, do you want to do this or do you want to do this? Or you can do this and then you can do this. It's, it's up to you. Choice is really, really uh, helpful, I think. I think I'm so glad you brought that up. And Fran, you had something you were thinking of saying. I do. I have one more challenge. Uh, actually, two. One is name tags. I'm new, so sometimes I'm watching the kids. I don't want to put my name tag on or the kids make their own name tag. It's illegible. Right. On their hip. I mean, what good is it? Um, the other thing that I wonder is, Sometimes I see people coming in and they look like they just got out of bed. Nobody brushed anybody's hair and they didn't eat. It doesn't look. Or they want to run over and, um, you know, eat the food uh, that's set out next to the coffee. So I'm a big food person. I mean, I, for children's theater for many years, we would have food first. Yeah. (laughs) After school was food first. Yeah. I'm trying to make extra work, but I'm trying to make a really deep connection right away. I don't want to have, you know, cats and monkeys running all over the place. Not unless we're doing that show, you know, we're doing a play that's called the cats and monkeys. You know what I'm saying? I'm looking for, um, what, what are some of the things that you do? Do you feed them? What about name tags? What about, I mean, obviously sometimes they don't want to do something. But you can give them always choice. I guess the big thing to me is about boundaries. You know, we're in a neighborhood that's fairly safe, but it's a little sketchy because there's homeless people nearby. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Tickle. Mm. Yep. So I don't want to put. I don't want to project fear 
and yet sometimes I feel that. So I mean, I'm and I've been trained as an actress. Sometimes I can remember, you know, put your calm, clear, cool, friendly, smiling demeanor on, and remember that. One thing I've been teaching is yoga for many years, and I realize if I can learn to smile, because I think a lot when I'm thinking, my face looks like this, because there's a stern, not a sternness, I think maybe it is stern, uh, but it looks like I'm preoccupied because I'm thinking, because I want to think, I want, but then I realize I look terrible, I don't look very friendly. So I'm trying to learn to practice for myself, what I call the Buddha smile or Mona Lisa. I've been using Mona Lisa. And if I see that picture of Mona Lisa, it helps me. I'm not trying to be fake. I'm just trying to learn to have loving kindness as my base. That's my premise. <coughs> yep. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, you know, Alice brought up a good point. I, um, I do have a challenge and that's, um, that I do these all age Sundays and was from my predecessor doing children's chapel, but most people do children's chapel with a parent in the room. And that's not the way they do it here because what it's the intent was to have one less Sunday where parents have to get involved. So I decided to can and thanks to Soul Matters to can children's chapel. And I am calling it First Sundays. First Sundays on whatever theme is with Soul Matters. Oh, nice. Point out to the kids that our theme is the same that's in the sanctuary, and then I take it for there. But I still have a challenge, though, with it, is that because I get all of the kids. Now, I can have 18 kids, and they can be preschool up to school and the middle school kids have stopped coming because they said they don't like being with the little kids right. and I lose it's when I try to address the elementary age kids in the middle school because they don't have any interest they don't have the attention span so that that probably is my big challenge right now yeah boy yes good that uh, excellent point I did an interim, very short interim at the Boulder Church, and they had the same problem of who would show up. And I was brand new. I didn't know the children. And some of them looked like they had just come out of bed and they were hungry. And mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So even though I am the kind of person that's always like, oh, jump to solutions, I'm really glad we're reflecting to each other our challenges because this has brought up some really good topics. and. And so now, are we ready to say to each other, <clears throat> so what, I mean, we can't solve the problem of discontinuous attendance. Every single mainline Protestant and UU church is experiencing mm -hmm. this. I will reflect to you, my mother taught UU Sunday school for 16 years, second grade, and in the 50s and 60s, everyone came and you knew who your group was and you, and there she was. She was like the second grade teacher forever. Oh, I pine for those days. And yet we don't have that. I would, I, I would be, it would be a gift to me if I could just separate the elementary and the older kids from those younger kids. Oh my goodness, I know. And then there's the whole thing of middle school. Yeah, yeah. You know. Fetal adults. When, I, when I serve the big congregation, I find serving bigger congregations is easier than smaller congregations because you can create those groups. Yeah. And I can't seem to um, engage the, the few middle school kids that I have. They want to stay home at this point. They don't want anything to do with church. And that makes me sad. Yeah. But I don't know what else to do. Right. And, and we are almost in the parents situation, which is we can't do it. It mm -hmm. really needs to be the peer group at this point. They're transitioning to wanting to see their friends. Yes. You know, yeah, so as much as mom and dad want them to come to church or do anything, they're going to start paying much more attention to what their friends are doing. 
Mm -hmm. And so that's the solution is to create a system where their friends will come and they see each other. I mean, it's, and then we as, as parental types have to step back and maybe ask a young adult to be the advisor, you know, because those kids love when young adults pay attention to them. I'm yes. talking, you know. Well, I, I told my minister, I said, I think they don't want to see an older face that we need to get somebody younger to lead the group. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, you may know that I offered the GA middle school camp for three years. So this was general oh, assembly. Okay. A group of 50 middle schoolers would walk in, not, you know, from all around the country, not knowing uh -huh. each other. And <clears throat> I was very, very fortunate in that we were able to quickly use the young adults in the room and start playing games, 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 and then food, food, food. Fran, it's just like you said. I was like, we're not going to try and do any content. We're going to do games and foods. And mm -hmm. then by late afternoon, they were ready to settle down. And we did a um, neighboring faiths program at GA Middle School Camp. So I found wow. the congregations yeah. we could walk to with all 50 kids. And by the end of the four day camp, it was awesome. They were like 20 year olds at these other faiths asking mature questions and being so grown up. Of course, then they come home and have a pillow fight because they were really <laughs> and they're like, ah, we've been old enough. But, but so I know what's possible with middle school, mm -hmm. how deep they can go and how grown up they can be. And yet I also know that their brains are developing like infancy have you ever seen the research that the limbic brain is growing faster than this brain the reason mm -hmm. yeah. so that's why we get the fight or flight middle school squirreliness because their reasoning center hasn't caught up yet i mean it's fantastic stuff that you you see so in terms of dealing with everyone the other thing i will reflect back to you is the story of Liz Strong, who was our first PhD religious educator. And I interviewed her for my book called Full Circle, which was published uh, about lifelong UUs. She was asked at age 12 to be a full on religious education teacher in her wow. universalist church. Yeah, see, it changed the paradigm. Yeah. So if we can get the ones interested in that kind of leadership mm -hmm. rather than making it a challenge that they we need programming for them what if they become the leaders of a real program i mean she she described it that she was the sunday school teacher it wasn't just well would you help me you know put the tablecloth on or something so <clears throat> but, but again, I think, unfortunately, that is a thing of the past, too, because when I served the larger congregation um, some eight, ten years ago, I got teenagers to teach all the time, okay, and it went really well. But then this public school system changed things, and when you were required to put in your 30 hours of service, they would no longer get it to the church because it's an easier way to get your 30 hours of service. Wow. It, it just disappeared on me. It just, wow. So that was, you know, because I thought I had fun, you know, with these kids. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's the way it is. Yep. <clears throat> the other thing I will mention and please interrupt me if you are thinking of something good that we can put into this reflection. But in terms of looking at these challenges for multi-ages, mm -hmm. there's, there's what I call Katie's three S's of what our faith communities need to provide now for children. 
it's not so much that we are purveyors of information anymore because they can look up Buddha's eight spoke wheel of life on the web and Google it and find out what a Sikh is. It's that there's three things they can't do anywhere else. And, and those are the three things I want us as congregations to concentrate on. Sunshine, silence, and service. Let me tease those out. Sunshine is connection to nature and movement, Fran, which they don't get. They're doing screen stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So sunshine is nature and movement. Silence is to stop the monkey brain of multimedia chattering schools. I mean, if you ever walk through a junior high or high school these days as an adult like us, it's it tears you apart to imagine them in there six, seven, eight hours a day because it's noisy and tiled and it's like spending your whole day in a girl's bathroom. Ugh. So silence, <laughs> um, sunshine. And the last one is service, which I'm, I mean this kind of service as serving others, leadership opportunities. Those who are listening to the recording probably have heard this before that the, the whole idea of when you're 13 and you walk into a 7-Eleven, you're either followed suspiciously because you might shoplift or you're ignored. And I feel like our faith communities need to provide a place where their gifts are acknowledged because they have gifts just like everyone in the congregation has gifts that they can bring. So sunshine, silence and service and those three s's if you concentrate on them and i do put those in the packet each time because i feel it it's so important it's an important orientation to us it might make it easier to do these you know who's going to walk in today kind of things because sunshine and connection to nature everybody can do that silence is something that everybody can share I'll talk more about that in a minute. And you know, one of my biggest successes this year was I used uh, in the Time for All Ages, uh, it was um, a lay service. This topic was silence. Mm. So I found a story called The Boy Who Searched for Silence. It mm. is a fantastic story. And what came out of that, when I got the kids into the classroom, I whipped out yoga mats, mm. some yoga, and then the following week, I did meditation. They didn't want to get off the mats. It was so quiet. I thought, I don't believe this, you know? Yeah. Kids want that quiet in their life, too, you know? Yeah. They need it so much. They need yeah. It. Wonderful story. I'm glad. And I will look for the boy who searched for silence. That sounds good. Other solutions we might offer each other to these problems and challenges, the newness and the age groups? Um, I, I just want to say, um, especially for Fran, who doesn't know that there, there are um, some, there is some support in the larger UU uh, community. For example, middle school, there's mugs. Um, which they have in, in, in our district. I think you're, I don't know if you're, you're part of the Pacific, I guess it's PWR now, we're all actually, Colorado this way is all in the same region, but in the Pacific Central District, that's my district. So they have mugs and so, um, that's a way for, uh, for my daughter definitely, and they have a camp and they do four retreats a year. And the kid, that's an opportunity for them to be with kids their own age and be in a safe environment and do games and hang out. And, and I'm really super um, excited that my daughter has, you know, joined that part of the, the association outside of just our small church. So mm -hmm. there is that resource is, and there's also youth, there's youth programs as well that you can hook into. The other opportunity that I really see here, Fran, for you is, Katie talked about this being a, re, a month to revisit covenant. You may not have had a chance to do a covenant with your group, but that's a way to address um, some of the challenges that you're talking about, like 
please, you know, wear name tags so that we can all know each other and greet each other. And if there's somebody new, you know, you, you can covenant that. And, and I saw you did a little thing about shooting, of course, being kind and, you know, what behavior is acceptable. You can deal a, a covenant a lot of that stuff. So you're in a great position uh, this month to sort of use covenant as an opportunity to help you maybe solve some of your problems, I think. And another way I've, um, that I have discovered to get kids to, you know, um, share and uh, get to know their names is every time I have the group together, because they're not always the same kids, I will say, oh, there's somebody in the room new today. Let's go around, let's say our name, and then I'll come up with something. Um, mention one thing you're joyful for, or you know, just throw some topic out there. And it's amazing. And sometimes just for the fun of it, I'll say, okay, let's go back around the room. Tell me who's here. And you kind of make a game out of it. But that's the way I have to learn too. I'm, I'm a hands-on type of learner. And um, the more I do that kind of activity with people, then I remember the name. You know, I have to have association with them. Mm -hmm. So, like I say, I find asking them every Sunday, and it's not boring because I've changed the topic. I'm saying, you know, say your name. We're going around, and you know, what are you joyful for? Or what? Uh, like, uh, we're starting a new year. Uh, what's your hopes for the for the new year? You know, or what would you like to see different? And it's amazing, you know, what they will come out with, too. And, and it helps me remember who they are because of that additional information about them. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we started a little late, so I don't want to shut us down, but we are within a few minutes of ending. Um, last comments you have. Fran, did you, have you been thinking about some things? You know what, I have this uh, recognition that when I start to uh, withdraw from something and, and I want to resist it, I'm realizing, of course, what I resist persists. And what I'm recognizing is this, I, this constant thing I've heard from most teachers is there's something in our culture in general that there's some game of shooting, and I don't know whether it's a video game or whatever it is, and the kids play it. I mean just to say that it's not okay here or we don't do it, I think that that's um, like putting on a wet Band-Aid. I, I mean, I'm realizing I want to actually address that. That could be definitely a part of, well, why would we even want to have a covenant? But it, what if there's this real strong feeling of that's what they do? Obviously, I've got a place that I've been developing myself, and one part of it is with sound healing. Mm -hmm. And... You know, finding, finding the ways that I know that help me get centered and get clear in my mind, I want to share those with, with children. And what I'm imagining is that, um, can I help you? Can I help you? Steve Brown, and she said she wanted to hook and come here somewhere. Are you the new Ari? I am. I'm Steve. Steve, I'm glad to meet you. Glad to All meet you. Right. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to be here working for us. Okay, good. So there you go. There you uh, go. <laughs> so this is, I'm going to just kind of show you where I am. This yeah. is my room. I brought in things that um, make sense to me because I realize I'm a tactile, kinesthetic person and I need to have, you know, some of my old friends with me. This is uh, Rosie. I don't know if you can see her. Yes. Yeah, really rosy. So the, the theater piece that I'm bringing in, I know I've got to go slow and easy, but the, the violence that's in the culture um, and also the feeling even with adults, because it seems to me that we have a certain amount of, um, you know, I've got an issue and I've got, it, it, it's not just I've got an issue, I wonder if you can help me, but there's this violence that we have about it, anything that we're talking about any of the time. I belong to Toastmasters and I have the vision of helping these children become Toastmasters, to become speakers uh, like this, you know, and I hope I'm doing a good job of speaking to you because my heart is beating real fast and I'm really full of 
um, excitement, trepidation, um, and thrill. I mean, I'm feeling very joyful and who knows what's, what's here, except that I can see there's this wonderful structure and look at the wisdom that's already been laid down. And then how does it show up for today? So my question was about this, um, the boy who searched for silence. I wanted to find out the name of the author because I'd like to maybe use that. And that was a question that I had about this Sunday. We're doing the poem from Robert Frost about the, tr the road less traveled. You know, obviously, I feel like I can mime anything and create more of an engagement. But I recognize I don't want to overuse that. And I'm looking for a way to help the minister. He said, what can we, what story can we use for the children that would somehow uh, reflect that story of the Robert Frost poem? And I'm thinking what you said was the boy who searched for silence, that might be an answer. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can. Are you on. able to put that in the chat box as a link? Andrew Newman is the author, and it's on YouTube as well. Wonderful. There you go. Worth the price of admission right there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Allison, is there any final comments you'd like to share? You good? No, I'm good. Thank you. All righty. Irene? Um, I guess my final comment is I'm sorry I came late because uh, I would have loved to have heard the conversation prior. Well, it's recorded. Um, you can always go back and watch the recording. I'll be posting it in an hour or two on the YouTube channel. Oh, all right. Wonderful. Thank and you, I put, Katie. I put the link but, uh, in that Facebook page so you can always just link. Okay, wonderful. Great. Thank you. Well, welcome, welcome, Fran. It's fun to hear your enthusiasm. Lovely to see you all, and I wish you the best and hope to see you in February. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Have a good. Thank you.